Well, thank you, Paige, and hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be uh, here with you today in your uh, home offices or work offices. Um, it was a pleasure also to be working with Derek in the first session. He had a string there where I was just sitting back as he was answering questions left after right and thinking, boy, he knows his stuff. So uh, it's great to be here, and uh, we're here to give you solutions and peace of mind because we want to help you uh, eliminate those mysteries, those what if, you know, what should we be doing? I was actually kind of surprised to hear how many of you are industry veterans. I figured that we would have mostly um, newer uh, managers and board members here, but uh, it's our pleasure to uh, clear out the cobwebs and make sure you know that there is clarity to a lot of the questions that you have. Now, as we go through today's webinar, because you're muted to keep background noise to a minimum, if Derek or I ever need your feedback, we'll ask for hands raised. Like, are we, did you, under, did you understand this? Are you getting this point? Uh, do we need to show another illustration? Um, the way you raise your hands is by clicking the hands raised icon in your control panel. It looks like the one that you see on screen. So let's practice that. Let's be interactive. If we're going to be answering questions, we're going to have you live also. So grab your mouse and give me a click of the hands raised icon in your control panel if you're ready for us to start today's presentation. Derek, it looks like we have a sharp group. I've got hands raised all up and down my attendee list. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to click hands down. Uh, Derek and I have some prepared slides that we'll get to if we have uh, some questions that fit those. But uh, generally, we figure that we'll have your questions fall into uh, generally three categories, reserve study issues, reserve funding issues, or application issues. And then we also have the opportunity to do some demonstrations with a new tool that we've rolled out this year with uh, our clients called uPlanet. But um, as we start, uh, let me turn it back over to Paige. So Paige, what's our first question for this second session? All right, our first question is, where do the costs for reserve projects that are entered into the reserve study obtained from? The costs don't always jive with real, real estimates received. For instance, an elevator refurbishment costs 150,000 more than what was on the study. Hey, Robert, do you mind if I jump in and take this go. one? Yeah, go, go, go. Okay. Uh, so um, the first thing that jumps out is just it shows the importance of needing to update your reserve study um, often just to make sure that the component prices are in the right place. And so different companies have different accuracy levels when it comes to pricing and amount. And our, what we do is we use our experience on similar projects and similar buildings to actually price out projects. And an elevator modernization costing $150,000 today doesn't surprise me. Uh, we, we've seen uh, elevator modernization prices go up 20% year over year for the last five years. And so if your study isn't current today, then the price point is probably out of whack or doesn't jive um, with what today's price point would be. Okay, great. Next question. We are one of two condo associations that share infrastructure, roads, and sewer system with a for-profit company and their rental apartment apartments. Is this common and is there a precedent for splitting costs and capital expenses? Derek, I'll jump into this one. Um, boy, that sounds complicated. Sometimes I think the field of reserve days is complicated, but boy, being an attorney and setting up an association uh, this shows how it can be a minefield. So we have, what, two condo associations and a for-profit company with their rental apartments, so three kind of facilities. Uh, first part of that was, is it common? The answer is no, it's not common. Uh, is there a precedent for how to split costs and the capital expenses? Hopefully, yes, and um, that should be your governing documents. It should spell out that your association is responsible for 30% or 40% of the entryway road, and then 18% of the tennis courts, 
and 75% uh, of this, your governing document should say that. In the absence of that, you need to have a community um, uh, panel that gets together and says, okay, how are we going to divide this up and get a, a well-established association precedent? And then you create your reserve study. And if you are responsible for 40% of the entry drive, like one of my clients, you put that entry drive in your reserve study and the price then becomes 40%. So if it was a $10,000 resurface project, then for you guys, it's only 4,000. So put it in your reserve study at the price fraction that is appropriate to your association's responsibility. Robert, I totally agree. Um, I wouldn't call it common by any means, but I do see it from time to time. There's communities and different entities that kind of share some communal area. And one alternative strategy that I've implemented over the years is to create a separate reserve study just for those communal assets. And uh, what it requires is that they set up a reserve bank account specifically for those shared components. And what's neat about it and clean about it is the funds go in through their regular regularly budgeted reserve contributions, but also go out as they pay for these expenses. So uh, that is one strategy that, that the clients could use. Yeah, I like that. That, that basically make another almost a community pool of funds that every all the um, stakeholders are contributing to. Yeah, exactly. And it's great for documentation as well. Yep, nice. Okay, next question. Given the low interest rate environment, it is no longer financially prudent to tie up reserve funds and saving account balances equal to 100% of reserve asset balances because of low savings interest rates. Is association reserves considering switching metrics for high, medium, low risk measurements to a liquidity measure such as number of years, expenses and reserve funds, rather than the solvency measurement currently used, which is percentage of total reserve assets. If not switching to a liquidity metric, is association reserves considering using both metrics in their reports? Derek, I'll jump on this one too, because I was involved in putting some of these metrics together. I like having these um, articulate questions. Uh, it shows someone who is really studying reserves from their point of view, but uh, let me start out by saying I respectfully disagree. The amount of cash on deposit is on a per owner level relatively insignificant. And so the difference between the 1% or half a percent that they're getting on the association side versus what you might be able to squeak out a little bit more as an owner, uh, that is really not very much when it comes down to cash and to potentially cripple the association's ability to do a project on time by leaving the cash in all the owner's pockets instead of having it ready. Derek, just like you answered in that last question, create a new community pool of funds, an extra reserve study, so the funds are there so you can get the projects done on time. There's timing is significant. So um, yes, interest rates are low, but to have the funds there ready and available in the association's bank account is very valuable. And I liked also understanding this um, listener. And let me get to this chart. We've got this chart on risk. Let me get right to that. Right here. Um, we've divided risk into three categories. A high risk is what they were talking about with um, a low percent funded, and that's cash on hand compared to the, the value of deterioration at the association. Medium risk area and a low risk area. So high risk is zero to 30 percent funded, 30 to 70 percent funded right here is a medium risk and low risk is above 70 percent funded. That's an incredible correlation to special assessments and you want to have the cash there and not um, leave the cash in owner's pockets and then have the potential of delay when you're trying to special assess those funds from the owners. It's also a fairness issue. You want to give the owners a, a good, uh, clear estimate of what it's going to cost on an ongoing basis to 
be a part of this association and pay your fair share. So we are not anticipating switching to a different metric. Um, we have a good correlation. This is a part of National Reserve State Standards, and we're very comfortable continuing to support that. Robert, I think you really hit it on the head when you said fairness, because the model of which is the reserve study is designed to treat the current owners and the future owners in the fairest way possible. And so if you live under you know, a roof within your community association for one full year, it's your responsibility to pay for that one year's worth, uh, worth of use of that roof. And so that is essentially fully funding the reserves at 100 percent. Yeah, just paying your fair share along the way. Awesome. Great answer to that question. Uh, next question. How many years into the future is a reasonably accurate forecast of needs and associated costs? I'll, I'll jump on this one, Robert. So uh, 20 years is the minimum per National Reserve Study standards. But here in California, where I'm based, it's actually required that we, we, we show 30 years. Um, and what, what's really important is that we don't disinclude or forget about components that are slightly just outside of that window. So I'm talking about your 35 year roofing system or major mechanical systems like a generator that's 40 to 50 years out. It's really important to just remember to include those in the study so that we can prepare to actually replace those projects when they come due. Yeah, and let me add that we don't expect to be right. Uh, we expect to be wrong 99% of the time and uh, that's the whole reason for updates every the reserve study is good for one year after that the components have changed the associations bank balance has changed their income stream has changed uh so many the economic environment has changed and so we have every expectation that we'll be updating that reserve state on a regular basis refining those what are now distant expenses as they come closer and closer and closer and closer and that gives the association uh, 20 or 30 years of advanced preparation. So the association avoids being surprised by something that should not be surprising and updates are the key. All right, next question. We have a question from Timothy. I'm an owner in a nearly 30 year old association that did not obtain a reserve study until three years ago. Naturally, the study showed how poorly funded the association was. Now in preparing a present presentation to owners, several board members are afraid that the amount recommended is not something some owners would not be able to afford or would be able to afford. I would like your recommendation on how to best communicate the need and get buy-in from all, all members in the association. Robert, sounds like a great demo, modeling the funding plan for them. Yeah, um, I've, uh, I've got a, um, that was it right there. Um, the gentleman's name again page was? Timothy. Timothy, okay. Um, speaking to Timothy, there is a cost of deterioration and you have the useful life, you know what the cost is and it boils down to how much is it deteriorating per year. And you could clearly say that at our association, we've been contributing for argument's sake, using the numbers on the screen, $10,000 a year, but our assets are deteriorating at a little over $20,000 a year. So we're, we're, every year we're getting behind. And those are expenses that are gonna happen. Reserve expenses are very predictable expenses. So they are destined, the, the roof is gonna fail. The asphalt is going to need to be resurfaced and you just need to get on board. And let me then um, switch over as Derek recommended to a demo. Um, we have, this new tool that's available to all our clients, it's called uPlanet. So when you sign in to our client center, if you're a portfolio manager, it looks just like this. And I'll pick the uh, sample townhome association. This is where you see your reserve study and then you have uPlanet. uPlanet is free to all our uh, professional reserve study clients. Uh, outside users can get an account for just $149 a year if they are not current reserve state clients. But it's a great online calculator. Uh, it shows your components. Here's again, the townhome, site components, building exterior components, the pool area, 
and allows you to set your starting balance and basically do your reserve planning. So uh, the question in this case was, um, what do we do? Well, let's, let's set up the scenario. This is a, an association that looks like it's a few years old. See how lots of things are aged. And uh, let's start them out with not a lot of money. Let's say $100,000. And um, let's go with some pretty neutral starting points. 1% interest, 3% inflation. Save that. Let's see what we got here. Okay, so they're starting at 40% funded. And if they are just doing what they're doing, this association is seven, they operate on a quarterly basis. So 7,300 per quarter, you can see they're going to crash and burn in five, in just about 10 years. So the question is, what do we do? Well, uh, something we recommend regularly is called the exercise plan. So we say, okay, you can start where you are right now. And let's just gradually get there. Let's make like 10% increases in your reserve contributions for, you know, maybe five years. And let's just test it. Let's recalculate. I'm a lucky man. Pretty good, Robert. You've been <laughs> yeah. doing this for a while. I, I'm looking good on this demo. But you can see that um, what we're, we're trying to get is the association into that over 70% funded range where... It's a low risk of special assessment. You don't have to get there right now. If you look at their expenses, their big expenses, they got a big one in five years and another really big year in nine years. So you don't have to upset the apple cart right now. You can just start where you are. And then in five years or so, they will get the reserve funding up to where it needs to be so that, um, let's show the cash flow on this. Uh, you can see that their cash flow. Robert, I, think your demo, I think your demo really represents uh, Timothy's association pretty well. I, I don't know it at all, but um, 30 years old, took them 27 years to get a reserve study completed. I bet they're underfunded. And so, um, you know, a model like this where they gradually build up reserves at 10% per year over five years is something that the community probably can get behind and kind of buy into. And it helps avoid that special assessment. Yep, I like it. All right, great. Uh, next question is, are investments for capital reserves generally restricted to CDs or other principal guaranteed investments? Do many associations make risky investments to gain higher returns? Um, do you want to go, Derek? I'll let you go, Robert. Okay. Um, I just got, I get a kick out of that because there's a lot, uh, just like that question a little bit ago about we're getting so little interest on our reserves. Is it worth even giving our money to the association because I can give it to my stockbroker, things like that? Well, when it's in the association's hands, remember the boards are acting as board members. They're responsible for the assets of the association. They can't take risks. You can't take risks when you're caring for someone else and their assets. So the uh, issue is, yes, you're going to hear it from all your community association industry professionals that you need to uh, place your reserve investments in safe investment vehicles. I hear it POP, protection of principle. You just can't be taking risks. There's always a trade-off. You can get higher return, but that involves greater risk. It's just not worth it because <clears throat> every once in a while, when an association does go down that path, you hear of, oops, they got caught. And instead of their reserves being $250,000 like it was last year, something happened with XYZ stock and their reserves are now 50% of what they were. It's just not worth it. And it puts the board members at risk by going against um, best practices in the industry. Yeah, Robert, the, these are nonprofit community associations, and so they're governed by um, board members that sit on, on the board and make decisions for these communities. And so they're protected by um, DNO insurance and so our uh, errors and emissions insurance. So it's just important that their, their, their strategy as far as funding goes is um, 
prudent and uh, avoids risk. Okay, great. Uh, next question. After three years contributing to a fully funded reserve funding plan, the HOA decides a 70% funding plan is more affordable. What is the best way to convert the existing plan from 100% to 70%? Yeah, great question, Paige. This happens often. Um, of course, 100% funding, uh, funding plan is the most risk adverse, but you know, 70% model um, is also a plan that many of our clients can get behind. I prefer 100% funding um, just because it's pay for what you use per, per the association. But um, I'm going to ask Robert to put up a, a slide here that represents this. Uh, Derek, is this what you're thinking? Yeah, so this, is, this represents a special assessment risk. And you can see that the risk is pretty low around that 70% mark and even lower at the 100% mark. But a baseline strategy that drives the funding levels down to 0% funded is an awfully high risk factor. Yeah, it's usually not worth the cost. Let me uh, draw that online calculator back into play here. And let's um, give this association a little more normalish type uh, funds like 175,000, something like that. And yeah, it's what, 70% funded. And let's just uh, set them to go. Okay, so they've got a full funding scenario. They start at 70, they gradually get up to 100% funded after five, 10, 15, 20 or 25 years, a nice gradual way. Let's look at this now. Um, this is their fully funded scenario, and they're setting aside, or the recommendation is to set aside 88.20 per quarter. And this board is saying, okay, let's, we've learned in this online Q&A that the special assessments are low once you get up to 70%, and there's not, not measurably, uh, Derek, I believe you said that, not measurably a whole lot of, um, benefit once you get above that. It's nice to be aiming for the bullseye, but not a lot of difference. So let's start to tweak this down. Starting at 8820. Let's see what happens at 8,000. And that's thereabouts. You can probably go a little bit lower. 7,900. Yeah, so you're bouncing around the roundish, the 70% level. So that's your difference. That with you plan it, you get to see. You're not uh, subjected to just guessing. Um, so your question is: Do we want to fully fund for eighty-eight twenty, or what was it seventy-nine hundred? We can save eleven hundred dollars a month if we only aim for being uh, seventy percent funded. So at least you know your decision points now. Robert, being a numbers guy, I quickly grabbed my calculator and I can tell you that the difference between uh, contributions at 100% funding level and a model and 70% threshold model is 11.6%. So that's just the difference in price point um, on a quarterly basis. Yep. Okay, while we're on the topic of percent funded, Suzette had a question. How do I explain 40% funding to new board members? They get confused over whether that means they are 40% of where they should be or have 40% of what they need. Um, Robert, I think we need a slide for this one. Yeah. Um, um, which, which slide? The same slide that we had? Um, uh, there's another one that shows uh, green level on top, um, neutral area, oh, and red on the bottom. Yeah. I'll get there. <laughs> there uh -huh. we go. Yeah, so, so I actually get this question a lot, probably daily. And so um, what 40% uh, funded means is it means that you currently have 
40% of the funds needed to theoretically cover all the deteriorated portion of your components. And so it doesn't mean that you'd be able to replace 40% of all the components at any one given time. You just simply wouldn't do that. What it does mean is, is that it's a ratio between the theoretical ideal funding level of 100% and current cash on hand. Okay, great. Next question. Is there an established requirement for capital expenses? Greater than five year life, over 5,000 in cost, some other combination of life and cost? Uh, Derek, you jump on that. I'm gonna get the uh, national standard four part test up. Yeah, sure. So um, Robert's exactly right. It's based on national reserve study standards, it has to be part of the common area, have a limited useful life. That life could be as low as one year in total. It has to have a predictable remaining useful life. You have to be able to understand when the project might take place and it has to be above a minimum threshold and so in order for it to be above a minimum threshold we typically understand that to be in the range of half a percent to one percent of the total annual operating budget all right Robert, anything down there uh, no i like that okay perfect next question then is from jan how do we start planning for the new California deck law? In the past, our CCNRs say homeowners are responsible. We have 50% of units with decks. Can both the engineering inspections as well as the repairs um, be reserve items? Derek, I'm glad we had you on this panel today. Um, for everyone out there, this is a new law in California, Civil Code 5551, if I'm not mistaken. Then uh, Derek was on a, a statewide panel last week speaking about this exact topic. So um, Derek, take it away. Yeah, it's a, it's a hot topic. I mean, it got asked in the first session earlier today. And uh, so it's a new topic. So it's effective as of January 1st, 2020. And it's often referred to as AKA the balcony bill, but I like to call it the elevated deck rule or inspection law, because it requires not just inspection of elevated decks over six feet, but it, in, it includes walkway decking systems, landings, anything that's um, designed or built out as wood framing. And it's required that um, in California, these decks are inspected every nine years, but the first time around it has to happen before January 1st, 2025. And so from a reserve study standpoint, we're building in um, inspection of these decks into the reserve study as a component. Um, there's going to be some real price associated with this inspection because it requires either a structural engineer or a licensed architect to actually do the inspection. And some of the inspections will be um, uh, disruptive where they're, they're kind of opening up the deck and sending in their tools to better understand the current condition of them. All right, great. Next question, going back to the topic of being fully funded. What is the definition of a fully funded association? No negative cash flow, never using more than 50% of reserves, always some minimum amount of reserve? I uh, wish I had a slide for that, but uh, I've got one that maybe we can at least work with. A fully funded balance is, like Derek said, it's the value of deterioration. It's pretty easy to see here on these first two components, the fully funded balance for the first component, it's the, the value of deterioration. So if it has a five-year useful life and its remaining useful life is zero, it's fully depleted. So the fully funded balance is $4,600. And the second one, the pool, you can see it's halfway used up. So the value of deterioration is $5,000, half of this $10,000. So it's a moving target. Every year as you go through, um, another example here, easy one, building repaint. 10 year life, one year remaining. So nine tenths of the life is used up. You should have 45, it's got $45,000 worth of deterioration. So you should have $45,000 uh, set aside. You add up all this fully funded balance 
and that's what you compare your actual cash to. So it's a, a well-defined equation. It's not just a, um, a soft number. You look at your bank balance and you calculate the fully funded balance for each of your components, uh, sum that up and you compare that fully funded balance to the amount of cash that you have. I like how you put it, it was a moving target because it's true, every year it needs to get recalculated because the remaining useful lives often become less or less the project was completed and the cost estimates often become more expensive. And so that uh, theoretical or ideal deterioration uh, price point um, continuously moves and oftentimes grows. Okay, great. Next question. How is expected loan financing or a special assessment factored into developing the reserve funding plan? Great question. So there's really four ways that you can pay for your reserve components. And uh, I'll start with the best and easiest way. That's just regular budgeted reserve contributions. Um, but the next way that you can potentially pay for reserves is by special assessment which is something that no one um, likes. It's the dreaded special assessment community association. But you can also pay for them with loans through HOA banks. And finally, the, the final way that you can pay for reserves is just through deferred maintenance, which often um, uh, uh, equates to just decline in property value. And so once you've identified your mechanism for paying for reserves, then you can you need to add that into the cash flow model within the reserve study so you can disclose it to all the owners. This is how we're going to pay for reserves and you, you need to be able to show it in your 30 year model. Okay, great. Next question. What is the average percent of reserve funding that condom condominiums have to have to support their reserve needs? Yeah, I've got a slide for this. Derek, you start talking and I'll find the slide, okay? Yeah, sure. So um, there's different fits and needs for all of our clients. It's not uh, one shoe fits all. And um, and the reasoning is, is because no communities alike. They all have different assets. They've all aged at different ways. There's all sorts of different provision of maintenance programs that different properties implement. And so, um, so here in this graph, I like it a lot. Uh, it shows that 25% of total assessments uh, is like the median like uh, uh, way to actually fund reserves. And um, so mo for most condo associations, somewhere between 20 and 40% of their total assessments needs to go towards reserves to keep pace to pay for all their components and deterioration that they experience. The um, I think the government, the FHA, initially came out with that 10% number, and that was just a, a magic number. It had no real basis in reality. So you can see that most associations need to be setting aside far more than 10% of total budget. There are a few that that is okay for them, and you find that out in your reserve study, but everyone finds out what the magic number is for their association based on their balance of common area assets, are they expensive assets like wood that needs a lot of care um, or different type of roofing systems, the different common area components, do they have pools and spas and tennis courts? This is, every association is going to be in a certain kind of category range and this helps them know that it just is what it is. But if we were to take a guess, we would say start out guessing at 25% and then adjust from there. Obviously, a reserve say is going to give you that actual number, but this tells you um, where you are in the ballpark. Okay, great. So we have a question from Art. Florida statutes require a condo be fully funded unless a majority of unit owners vote otherwise. If based on your study, the condo puts in your suggested amount to the reserve contribution line of the budget and agrees to future suggested increases, is it fully funded? Uh, we have to be real careful with the English language here. Fully funded is a status. It means you are at or very close to the 100% point. 
um, I believe the Florida statute says you need to be fully funding your reserves. And fully funding is what we showed on that uh, chart a moment ago. You have a goal of fully funding. You may not be there now. You may not be there in five years, but you will be there eventually. And that's the goal of your association. So uh, that is uh, an important uh, distinction in the English language that fully funding is a process. It talks about the contributions. Fully funded is a status. And it talks about the comparison as we've spoken about for the last few minutes, the comparison between your uh, reserve cash balance and the calculated amount of deterioration at the association. All right, next question. We use a pooled cash flow approach to calculating our reserve funding levels. Do you recommend a non-zero minimum for the projected reserve fund balances that you feel minimizes the chances of having to resort to a special assessment to meet unanticipated reserve needs? Absolutely. I'm going to flip back to an earlier slide that we showed. Um, what this person is talking about is um, baseline funding. Baseline funding is where you use the cash flow methodology to just barely have enough cash in the reserve fund to pay for the projected or anticipated bills. Well, as we all know, um, oh, um, I think it was John Lennon said it in a song, uh, life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. Life doesn't always happen according to plan. And so when you design, when you baseline fund your association, there's going to be times quite often that you literally run out of money. So that's why we have these different statuses in National Reserve State Standards, where we talk about different funding goals. And there we are. Um, so yes, we recommend not just sitting at barely having enough cash. We recommend pushing up above threshold and going towards full funding because that will mean that um, you and your association members are going to have a low risk of special assessment. You're fiscally responsible. Everyone's paying their fair share along the way. It's just a wonderfully nice place to be. And the property values are maximized. I like the color choices that you've selected. So green, yellow, and red. So green means go, yellow means caution, and red means stop. And so we want to encourage you to go towards the green and strive to be 100% funded. Yeah, a lot of benefit there. And remember, these are expenses that are going to happen. The, the only choice you have is, are you as a board member going to design your association towards paying for the expenses now on an ongoing basis with standard um, appropriately sized reserve contributions, or are you going to pay for it later via, as Derek said, a special assessment, a loan, or declining property values? All right, we have a question from Jan. Our complex is 35 years old. We now have several trees that have caused and or will cause building structural damage and have to be removed. Can we include these costs as a reserve item? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> oftentimes when I work with young uh, communities, like communities that are just getting going, the trees that the developer, the builder plant are maybe just as tall as I am, maybe shorter. And by the time I work with them some 20 or 30 years out, or maybe it's a different development, those trees are several times taller than me. And what happens is, is they have a big root foundation of structure and they, they start to disrupt the sidewalks, the sewer lines, even the foundation. And so we start to kind of build that into the funding plan and the model itself and as components. And so it's just important to take a deep look when communities reach that 30 or 35 year, year mark and add components and funding for those, those trees. All right, next question. Our park loses its land lease soon and will be closing. We have $380,000 in, in reserves. What happens to this money? That's a, that's a good question. Um, we talked about the business judgment rule in the first session about how a board is responsible to 
uh, care, uh, they have a duty of care, duty of loyalty, and duty of inquiry. And right now you're talking to a couple of reserve study guys, and I have a feeling this question is better directed at your association's attorney. Um, so we're going to maybe throw some ideas out, but really this question should be asked of your attorney. My guess is that when you have a common area asset that has cash associated with it, when it's liquidated, it goes back to the owners, but that would just be a guess. Again, uh, Derek, do you have any ideas on that? Yeah, I think getting a, an attorney involved would be a great idea because maybe they could even renegotiate the land lease and the, the park would not need to close. And then the money can go towards future reserves. It's just, just a guess on my part though. Yeah, again, make sure you're asking the right expert. <laughs> ask an attorney legal things, ask a reserve study guy reserve study things, and ask your uh, tax preparer for uh, tax advice. All right, we have time for one final question. That question is, is there any liability to the board for not following recommended reserve contribution amounts? Um, I'm gonna get that business judgment rule slide up. Yeah, there it is. Um, the board is fundamentally responsible. Again, they have that duty of care where the association deserves quality um, services, duty of loyalty, where the board realizes that they need to vote and act in the best interests of the association, not their own personal pocketbook, pocketbook, and that duty of inquiry, asking questions. And here in 2020 is a great example that last year, we gave reserve recommendations that for argument's sake, were $10,000 a month. And here in 2020, the board is slammed with rising delinquencies, and it's really hard to make those reserve contributions, um, things like that. And the board sometimes is stuck between a rock and a hard place. Uh, we would recommend in that case, of course, that they reach out to the reserve say professional for a few minutes of free counsel or use that Planet tool to uh, figure things out. But, um, what do they do? Well, sometimes the board, in their wisdom, hopefully they document it nicely that, hey, in the best interest of keeping the lights on, literally, we had to cut back on our reserve contributions this year to make sure that we could pay the water bill, the electric bill, the insurance bill. Uh, we'll figure out how to pay for the roof bill in five years, but right now, we need to pay this bill now and so board members in the position of having the power to decide um, a reserve study is a recommendation and uh, you should take it seriously but it is not the end of the world if you as the board uh, have to decide to do something differently yeah the board of directors they they get choices they get to make decisions based on um based on, you know, their current position, uh, what's happening with that, their their site and their, their funds. Um, but at the end of the day, what I would highly recommend is just that you disclose it to all the ownership and membership. Um, here in California, we have a annual reserve funding and disclosure uh, that goes out as part of the pro forma budget. But in other states, you may not have that requirement, but just disclose what you're doing to all the membership so they know what's going on. That's Great. Safe. I'm sorry, go ahead, Robert. I was just going to say that's a safe way to do it. Just uh, document it and disclose it. And that's going to stack the odds in your favor of not getting sued. All right. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Robert and Derek. That concludes part two of our two part webinar today. If anyone is interested in a recorded version of this or any other webinar, you can search them on YouTube or on the Association Reserves webinars page. If you enjoyed today's session and would like to receive the Association Reserves newsletter or announcements of future webinars, please visit www.reservestudy.com and scroll to the bottom to sign up for the newsletter.